let's get into the Word of God. We are in the book of Kings, 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18. Verse 16 tells us, So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. When he saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? Elijah had been somewhat on the run, had been evading the corrupt government of Israel at the time, led by King Ahab and Jezebel. And finally, Elijah was willing to confront the king. It was time. God had given him uh, the A-OK. And so it says, I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver? How long will you Will you waver? That question is for us today. Between two opinions. How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for trusting us in this space as we delve into your word. We want to be challenged by your word as we delve into a new year We want to be challenged and motivated and inspired to be what you have called us to be. Father, make this a reality this morning. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen and amen. Prophet then tells us, Elijah in verse 22, Am I the only one of the Lord's prophets left? But Baal has 450 prophets. Now we know there's going to be 400 prophets from Asherah and 450 prophets from Baal. And there's one prophet of the true God. Elijah against almost a thousand prophets. And the showdown is going to be on Mount Carmel. And all of Israel is going to show up. Now at this moment, does Elijah appear to be pretty bold to you? In this moment, does he seem to be a little bit superhero-ish a little bit, right? Bold, before the king who can have him executed, challenging him and his prophets, challenging Jezebel's prophets. Everybody show up on Mount Carmel. It's about to go down. Man, these are the moments in the Old Testament where I'm like, oh, wow. This is why this guy deserves a fiery chariot, a fiery limo to pick him up. This is how Elijah gets his name in lights. He's so bold. He's so big. He's bigger than life in this moment. The word of God tells us that the prophets, they set up this competition. Elijah gives them the rules of it. This altar is built, and and they're to praise and worship their God. And if their God exists and is pleased with him, he would rain fire out of heaven and light up their sacrifice on the altar. And of course... If God is real, then he would do the same. So the competition is pretty clear here. The television cameras are rolling. The Bible tells us that the prophets are praying and praising and dancing, and nothing is happening. At noon, in verse 27, we're still in chapter 18, at noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Boys and girls, it is not good to taunt. But in this moment, the prophet is talking a little trash, right? A little basura, right? He starts taunting them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he's a god. (laughs) Perhaps he's in deep thought or busy or traveling. Maybe 
the Bible tells us. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until their blood flowed. Midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice, but there was no response, no one answered, no one paid attention. Family, why is that the case? Why did no one answer? Why did no one pay attention? Why was there no response? Because there was no God. The gods of Baal did not exist. They were not alive. They were make-believe. Now listen, when God tells us to have no other gods before him, he's not telling us to do so simply because he's jealous and doesn't want you in another relationship. God tells you not to have any other gods before him because there literally are no other gods before him. And he cares so much about your well-being that he wants you to be in a relationship that is actually functional. Someone say amen on that. Where if you pray, you actually get a response. That when you surrender to God or the, your other gods, that there's actually, there is actually a covenant, an agreement on the other end. But God knows there are no other gods. So when he tells his children, and we see it in the Ten Commandments, they have no other gods before me. Do not worship any other gods. God is telling us to use our common sense. Stop talking to trees. They will not respond. Stop talking to stone. It will never act on your behalf. So now Israel is faced with the reality. There is no more smoke and mirrors. There is, no, there is no prophets trying to deceive the people. At this point, it is clear the prophets of Baal have been lying. The prophets of Asherah have been lying. So now it is Elijah's turn. In verse 36, it says, At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward. And he prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord. Answer me so these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Isn't that so beautiful? All of this, all of what's happening right now was God's way of turning the hearts back towards his heart. Your, Lord, you're turning their hearts back again. And then he continues on, then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench because, you know, Elijah wanted it to be a little bit more difficult. So he had the entire altar just doused with water. It had trenches uh, 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 dug around the altar so it, it would also be able to gather water. So making it almost impossible for fire to be sparked. But of course, God is God and he is alive and he hears our prayers. Amen. Fire fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell what? Prostrate and cried. The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is, a little repetition there. The Lord, he is God. Now let me tell you something. God never wants to wait until this moment. He doesn't want to wait until there are fireworks to get your attention. This is the one thing he had to do often in Israel, especially leading them out of Egypt, was constantly the fireworks so that people would listen. God doesn't want to have to shout. He doesn't want to have to shake the earth. Some of y'all felt the earthquake yesterday. He doesn't want to do any of that kind of stuff. But when earthquakes shake the earth, all of us get a little religious, don't we? Don't we? You start to feel really small. And then you start saying, Lord, is my, is my heart right with you? When you're on the plane and there's a little bit of turbulence, you start getting real spiritual, don't you? Are you in that roller coaster at Six Flags and you, and you thought you were still cool enough to, to ride the Viper? And then you start getting spiritual again, right? But God doesn't want to have to wait for these moments before we call out to him, before we recognize it. These are the rock bottom moments that many of us draw our attention to God and say, Lord, okay, 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 I'm now listening. But God doesn't want to have to wait to these moments. And we're going to find out as we continue on the moments that God is really relishing to have between us. They all fall back prostrate. You are God. Oh, this is a wonderful moment. The, the hearts of Israel return to the Lord, and the famine ends. 
there is rain that is now beginning to fall. And so the people see that God has heard their prayers and they're ready to have their lives right with God again. But this is a good thing when your life is right with God, when you are aligned with God. I don't care what tumultuous, turbulent, earthquakey experiences you are having around you, there is a way that God keeps us steady in the storm. Have any, anybody want to testify to that today? That no matter what you're going through, no matter if, it, if it's a cancer diagnosis, there is a peace that you have, a calm that you have in the storm. God doesn't call us to follow him so that you only have rainbows in your life. Following God means you will have crosses, but there's something on the other side of those Calvary experiences. There's something on the other side of those Goliath experiences and those fiery furnaces. There's something beyond those Mount Carmel experiences, and this is why God calls us to trust him. So everybody's excited. Oh, they're interviewing Elijah on television, right? The ESPN reporters are there. They're showing the slow motion, right, of the fire coming down out of heaven. This is a big-time event, pay-per-view. I mean, people were all there. They're all talking about it. And someone doesn't like the interview that Elijah's been giving. Jezebel hears about it. And the Bible says that Jezebel has a tweet Chapter 19 of 1 Kings, verse 1 says, Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel tweeted a message to Elijah saying, May the gods deal with me. So she's still acknowledging those gods exist. May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Now, this is what Elijah reads. Now, you know Elijah just took down 950 prophets in front of all of Israel and was victorious. Elijah saw the, the small, dark cloud, as small as a man's fist, coming towards them, and he knew that from that cloud that God would drench the land with rain. Elijah even experienced supernatural power that he was able to run faster than the flash, faster than horses, to make it to where he needed to go. I mean, Elijah is on a tear of spiritual phenomenon. I mean, this man must be glowing right now. And he reads this tweet. In verse 3, and the Bible says, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. Wait, what? Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. This is the Elijah that was talking trash. This was the Elijah that was taunting. This was the Elijah, again, faced against all the enemies of God, head on, and said, bring it. One harmless tweet from Queen Jezebel has this man now running for his life. Oh, it gets worse. <laughs> it gets worse. The Bible says that, that when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. While he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had, an, I have had enough, Lord. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Wait, What? <laughs> By leaving his servant behind and walking into the wilderness without water, without food, a day's journey, he basically was signing his own death certificate. There was no way he would be able to journey back to where there was civilization. There was no way he could go forward, backward, to the side, to the left, to the right. He was killing himself. And prayed it, Lord, let me die. I'm no better than my ancestors. Remember, he told us already on Mount Carmel, I'm the only one left, only one around, only one who's been faithful. Can I ask you a question? What was it about Jezebel's tweet that made him so unbalanced? The man that seems to be the perfect embodiment of balance, the one who says, stop being unbalanced, Israel, stop 
wavering, the left or the right. Stop wavering between two opinions. You know that God is right. You know that God is good. Trust him. He's wanting to recapture your heart with his love. And now, has he forgotten? Can I be honest with you? I'm not a, I'm not a professional in this field. I'm not a psychologist, not a therapist. But doesn't this look like almost like a manic depressive situation? Right? Doesn't it almost come off like Elijah's a little bit bipolar? I mean that clinically. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that dismissively. I, think about it. Mount Carmel looks like Elijah in manic mode. Come on, y'all, bring it. That's right, bring it. You and me, I'll take all y'all on. What's up? And then once he comes down from the high of that experience, where is he? He wants to stay in bed all day. He doesn't want to eat. Life is not worth living. Too often when we look at Scripture and when we look at our heroes in life, we like to see them on the top of the mountain. We want to see them on Mount Carmel. We want to worship our heroes. We want to worship our idols. They're the best. They're the greatest. When often most of their life is spent in the valleys. And we don't like valley talk because valley talk uh, is depressing, right? And I'm not talking about like valley girl talk, like, oh my goodness, what are you doing, Elijah? No, I'm talking about valley, like, 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 like the deep, dark shadows that, that, that David talks about in Psalms 23, right? This is what I'm talking about, the valley moments that we have. See, most of us, we want to be able to worship our heroes in the moments they're on top of the mountain. See, see, when you fall in love with the pastor, for most of you, for most of you, when you fall in love with the pastor, it's, it's in the preaching moments, right? This is where we connect. Uh, yesterday, I had an opportunity to play with uh, uh, Sam Adarme, one of, our, one of our attendees. He's not a member yet, but we'll, 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 we'll see what happens. Great, great man. He and Helen, just wonderful, wonderful couple. And so he plays tennis, and, and, he, and I told him, I said, let's go for it. Let's do it. So I, I'm playing him on Friday, you know, and I'm looking at Sam. I'm like, you know, I'm going to be easy on him, right, <laughs> you know? But, you know, it's not important to talk about the score of the game, right? You know, when you think about it, it's really not important, you know, because what it's really about is fellowship. So... I'm not going to tell you what the score was, and I don't think you should ask him either, you know? You might put one of us in an awkward situation. But I remember after the game, you know, he was feeling a little sorry for me. He goes, hey, you, you want to play? I said, no, no. And listen, man, this is just about fellowship. Just about, about fellowship. I'm, I'm, I'm learning. I'm learning. We had a good time. We had a, we had a really good time, and we're going we're gonna to play more tennis. And if you like to play tennis, you can play with Sam as well, right? This is how we connect as a community. So here's the thing. So here's the thing. We, we would like to celebrate people in these moments at, at their height, but it is more important to see our heroes when they're losing, when they have lost. Because often, it's in these moments where we learn and grow the most. Elijah is having a moment. And I think that it could be said there's a number of prophets in the Old Testament that display some manic, depressive behaviors. So what is God to do? What's he going to do with his champion? Now, if I'm God, he could have a moment like Jonah, who also had suicidal ideation. Remember that? In our series on Jonah? Throw me overboard. Lord, I wish I was dead. I wish I were dead. So, so here, God now has an opportunity to talk to Elijah. His prophet is hurting. He's depressed. He's ailing. And this is where I expect God to say, come on, Elijah, you know better. Look at what I just did 24 hours ago for you. Are you seriously contemplating killing yourself? Watch what God does here. The Bible tells us, as we continue on, that the Lord sends a messenger, an angel. And what does this angel tell, tell Elijah? Get up, Elijah. All right, here comes the pep talk. Get up, Elijah. Raise up. Oh, Elijah wakes up. And he sees bread baked on hot coal and a glass of water. 
And the angel says, in the name of the Lord, have something to eat. Have something to drink. And then go back to sleep. Wait, 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 hold on. You were dispatched from heaven. You are a messenger of the Almighty, the Most High. And your message is eat some bread, drink some water, and take a nap. Elijah, praise the Lord, is obedient. He eats, he drinks, he sleeps. The angel of the Lord comes again. Oh, now it's about to go down. Oh, the angel's going to just, he is going to reprimand this prophet. How dare you embarrass yourself and all of heaven? Nope. Wakes him up, says, here, my friend, have something to eat, have something to drink, and rest. Because the journey that's ahead of you is great. It appears that Elijah is having a spiritual conundrum here, a, a, a problem of faith here, right? Uh, 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 it, it seems that he's lost his grip on reality, and, and the angel's first instruction isn't think differently, Elijah. The first instruction is eat, drink, sleep. When I was a chaplain at Pacific Union College, a lot of students would come into my office, and there was a lot of resources on that campus. There were, there were therapists there, uh, teachers in the psychology department that, that number of the students could talk to, and they'd come into my office, and they'd say, Pastor, I'm really going through a difficult time. I, I think it's a spiritual issue. Um, tell me what, what books of the Bible should I read? What, what should I do? Now, I know you're going to think, as a pastor, there is a chaplain at PUC that I would simply tell them, you need to pray more, or you should have a devotional life, and what books are you reading? Can I recommend one for you? This is what I would always ask the students. What time do you go to bed at night? What time do you usually go to sleep? Do you think they were going to bed at 10 p.m.? I'd ask them questions like this. Do you eat breakfast regularly? I'd ask them, do they drink enough water? Like totally unspiritual stuff, right? Because most of us, believe it or not, most of us have the crisis of faith because everything in our physical life is out of balance. And we don't understand the very sympathetic nature between the body, the mind, and the soul. And because we don't understand that, we always want to talk about spirituality as if it's divorced from physical, mental, and emotional health. And God, who is more spiritual than all of us and knows the body better than all of us, sees a crisis of faith and knows that Elijah hasn't been sleeping. And he hasn't been eating. And he hasn't been drinking enough water. He's like, brother, you were so hyped on Mount Carmel. You were so hyped up before the fight. You were not sleeping the night before. You have been anxious, and I know you were successful, but it came at a price. Your body is now crashing. You're not thinking clearly, and it's not because you're not talking to me. It's because you've ignored all the physical warning signs. When we talk about a connection with God, we must always talk about it in connection with how we live our lives. I'm telling you this right now, and most of you know this. If you read a lot of the red books in our church, you know, again, there's a sympathetic relationship between our physical health and our spiritual life. Some of you are manic depressive. Some of you have bipolar disorder. Some of you struggle with depression. This is real for you. And you've, and you've looked at faith as your way out of it. And I'm not telling you it's not a part of the ingredients. I'm just saying you can't ignore the basic needs of your body. And going into 2024, we want to do great things in this church. We want to do great things in this community. And we will not be able to be successful, or nor will it be sustainable, if we are unhealthy ourselves. Your New Year's resolution is about losing weight, right? Because you just want to look cute. That's superficial. 
We want your New Year's resolution to be about health because we know that being a healthy person makes you healthy here. It makes you healthy here, right? In the mind and in the heart. Aren't you tired of being out of balance? Aren't you so tired of feeling like even when you get what you've been craving for, what you've been praying for, you now have it in your life. It's that relationship that you've been clamoring for, and now it's in your life, and you're still not happy. Oh, you felt the high of Mount Carmel. Oh, he called me back. We went on our first date. I think it's happening. You had the high of Mount Carmel, but now the next morning, where are you again? You're in the valley, and you'll think it's something financial. Oh, if I just had a raise. Oh, if, if people just liked more of my, my photos on, on social media. Oh, oh if, if only the pastor would preach sermons that made sense, right? Oh, of only, you're finding all these excuses. The world is not out of balance. You are. Eat. Drink. Sleep. My challenge to you, church family, is that you adopt healthier sleeping habits. That you get to bed earlier. None of this, I, listen, I'm the one that says all the time, I'm a night owl. I'm used to going to bed later. But I'm also used to waking up and going to work, and then around 1, 2 o'clock, I feel like I need to knock out. God didn't design us that way. After a good night's sleep, we should be ready to take on the prophets of Asherah and Baal. Adopt healthier sleeping habits. Drink enough water. Your body needs it. Your body is not craving Coke Zero. I know, less calories, you're feeling better about it, but that's not what your body needs. Your body needs water. Drink enough water, and ladies, it's great for your skin. You're going to look so beautiful. It's going to clean your pores. Your, 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 your digestive system is going to work, you know, better. I mean, all of it. And eat right. I just watched a series on Netflix where they, they, they uh, it's a four-part series on you are what you eat, and they, they do a research on, on twins. And this study is out of Stanford. There's been another, a, a couple other studies where they use twins and give them different diets and habits, uh, exercise habits and everything like that, and then they, then they just kind of measure at the end, you know, how are these individuals living? I'm still going to say this to you. The plant-based diet, I call it the OG diet, the original garden diet, is still the best one. This is not, no, you have to buy all the Loma Linda products. No, because those can be unhealthy too. Sorry, Loma Linda. This is about us being more plant-based because we were designed for it. You go back to Genesis chapter 1, God gives us our diet. The one who created you, who knows you, and understands your body has given you fuel for it. For you to look him in the eye and say, I know better. It's foolishness. Right? And if you're not ready to make that, state, then make, make that step, then moderate. But just know this, whatever you do for your body that is better for your body is going to bless your mind and bless your heart and bless that connection with our creator. So watch this, watch this, watch this. So eat, drink water, rest. What's the next component? <laughs> the next component is for him to travel throughout the wilderness for 40 days. So for 40 days, this man is traveling. He's eating, he's sleeping, and traveling 40 days. Traveling back in those days was exercise. Yes, I'm talking about L.A. fitness. Elijah did some, he, he joined the gym. Hello? My man had to eat right, drink enough water, have a healthy sleep cycle, right? Getting to bed around 10 or 11 for some of you night owls, right? Getting that good sleep. And then he had to exercise. And this is all before God says a word to him. God is like on mute right now because he's like, I ain't talking to you until you get your stuff right. Eat, drink, sleep, exercise. By the time that Elijah gets to the cave where God is wanting to meet with him, God says to him, what's wrong, my man? What's wrong? What's happening? God finally speaks out. And what does Elijah say? This is 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 10. 
He says, I have been very zealous for God, the God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, right? Put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. So this is how he sees his life, right? I have been faithful. I have been, I have been more than you've asked me to be. I have done all you've asked me to do. And I am the only one left because your people have killed us all. The Lord says to him in verse 11, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Oh, yeah, about to happen, about to happen. Come on, Lord, show up. Tell us what we need to know. The Bible says, Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the... Okay, wind so strong that rocks were shattered. Hello? Hello? Wind so strong that rocks were shattered, and the Bible has the audacity to say God wasn't in it. Remember, earth just shakes a little bit, and what do we, God is in it, right? Little, little small tremor, God is in it. The Bible then says that after the wind there was a great earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the let me pause here for a second. Take, 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 take it off the screen for a second, maybe. Take it off the screen for a second. Listen. Many of us, when we're trying to create balance in our life, and we believe it's a spiritual issue, we'll say, I just need to start coming back to church. And many of us are attracted, are attracted to church because we like the earthquake, we like the fire, and we like the wind. We learn to experience God in the wind. If the choir is singing, oh, oh, pastor. Mm. We love the wind. Oh, pastor, the music today, oh, the worship, oh, it was just amazing. Oh, I felt God. Right? When the earth shakes, oh, the organ, oh, 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 oh. now that's a real instrument. Did you feel that? God is in this place. He's in his temple. That's what we want. And the fire. Oh, the pastor. Oh, he brought, girl, he brought it. I remember some, church, some churches I go to and where I preach, they'll talk, they'll say it like this. Ooh, pastor, you were stepping all over my toes. Mm, you beat us up today. Happy they got beat up. Happy. Ooh, thank you for that word, pastor. Ooh, I don't like you. Ooh. So watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. We're, we're addicted to the wind, the fire, and the earth shaking. We need the lights. We need the flash. Some of you listening online, some of you listening online, the only church you want to go to is Loma Linda University. Right? You need a certain type of presentation. That's church for you. It's programming. And there's nothing wrong with that. I like the program. Listen, we're serious about programming here, too. We want it to look nice. We want it to look pretty. But the lights, the fire, the earthquake, the, the, the wind does not save us, nor does it establish a, a lasting covenant with God. It, it's, it's beautiful for encouragement and maybe inspiration, but it is, not the, it is not the foundation and the fibers of our relationship with God. And for most of us, if that's all we exist when it comes to our connection with God, it'll simply be like going to Disneyland. It's a bunch of roller coasters. Oh, that was amazing. And many of us, we exist in our connection with God just through the hype. And God is saying, there's something more. And that's why I love this. Elijah did not see God in the fire. He did not see him in the wind. He did not see him in the earthquake. And I'm not saying you can't see God in the sermon or in the choir. I'm not saying you can't. I'm just saying if that is all you get, it is not enough to have balance in your life. My word should be a reminder of what you experienced this week. My word should be a precursor of what your encounter is going to be like with God this week. The choir's inspirational music, the quality of the praise team, the professionalism they bring to the table should wet your palate for something more. It cannot be your main course. And if it is, you'll be unbalanced. 
That's why many of us will have these mountain type, mountaintop experiences in church on Sabbath, and then we hit the valley, and we don't know which way is left or right. He wasn't in the wind. He wasn't in the fire. He was not in the earthquake. And then the Bible says, we can put the verse back up there, Mavis. Then the Bible says what? And after the fire came a gentle whisper. Then and only then did Elijah say, okay, Lord, I hear you now. A still, small voice. Many of us have never heard this voice, have never heard this voice. A still, small voice. Church family, in the stillness, in the quietness, God is there. I'm not saying he's not here with the trumpets. No, 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 no. There's no place where we cannot find him. I'm talking about the nourishment that you need in order to have the balance where you can succeed in the valley and on the mountaintop. I'm saying it's in these moments. These still moments, they're, 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 it's not YouTube crazy. It's not social media. It's not stuff happening every eight seconds, and then it has to flash onto something else. Pastors should not have to compete with the mess that you put in your, in your mind all week long. I got to move around and talk loud sometimes and say things that are quirky just so I can keep your attention. If I were just to read, you'd fall asleep. You know it. In the gentleness, God speaks. Small. Not big, small. Why are you here, Elijah? The question again. Elijah's response is the same. <laughs> These prophets were killed, and then Jezebel was an angry tweet, and she had a lot of angry emoji faces after it. I knew I was dead, and I'm the only one around, and nobody cares. And God's response here is not Love me more, Elijah. Commit to me more. Watch what God does. Watch what God does. He simply tells him, he says, go back the way that you came. Verse 15, verse 16. Go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael, king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel. And anoint Elisha. Man, you need a student. <laughs> you need someone you can pour into. You've been alone for so long thinking it's only about you and not recognizing you have community. He says in verse 18, yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel. I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. You think you're the only one? There's 7,000 out there like you. The enemy wants you to believe you're the only one. You're the only one that goes through this. You're the only one that has imbalance in your life. You're the only one that's been bipolar. You're the only one that's depressed. You're the only one that needs medication. You're the only one that's in therapy. You're the only one that needs a psychiatrist. You're the only one with mental health issues. You're the only one who's emotionally unstable. You're the only one. You're the only one. No one could understand. And faith doesn't seem to actually save you in these moments. And God is saying, that's because I have a cocktail of things that I use. It involves meeting your physical needs. It involves meeting your emotional needs. Yes, it involves also meeting your spiritual needs. It also involves meeting your community needs. You've chosen to cut yourself off. You've chosen to isolate yourself. You've chosen not to be vulnerable. You've chosen to think you're the only one. There's more like you, Elijah. Open your eyes. And let me give you someone you can pour into so you can pass on what you've learned. Family, 2024. We want to be a healthy church. And it starts with a healthy you. It starts with a glass of water. <laughs> it starts with going to bed on time and having more of a schedule. It's about being healthy. It's, it's about what you put into your body. It's about how you exercise. And for some of you, it may be tennis, like Brother Sam. Or Brother Sam Carbajal, it might be golf. 
right? But you're active. You're doing stuff. You're not just, you're not just sedentary. You're not just sitting on the couch. Most of us as Adventists trying to avoid alcohol and how bad it is when sleep deprivation can be just as dangerous. It will involve you stealing away for sometimes hours to hear the still small voice. I'm going, Pastor, listen, I'm not going to church this Sabbath because I just need to connect with God one on one. I will pat you on the back and I'll say, see you later. Go listen to him. It may mean you're in the car and you don't turn on music, but it's gospel music. Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes the chancel choir, the gospel choir is just wind. And you need to turn it off. Not because it's bad, it's just not what you need in that moment. Be silent in your car as you're driving. Don't be afraid of your thoughts, but they're bad thoughts. You don't understand. I know they're bad. But when you surrender them to God, when you're doing the things that you need, you will hear that voice. Let the fire pass. Let the wind pass. Let the earth shake around you. You be steady. God is speaking. And when he reaches your heart, family, he will give you assignments because you have a purpose. This church has a purpose. We're going to be healthy. It starts with us individually. It will then begin with us collectively. We'll be healthy with one another. We'll, we, we will reconcile. We'll make sure our hearts are right with one another. We are also going to have purpose. There are people that need to learn from us. We have been called to teach. If you're a teacher, if you've been given wisdom and you do nothing with it, you die. Watch me. If you are not doing what God has called you to do, you begin to wither on the vine. That's what happens in nature. And this is why God says, if you do not produce fruit, you are like a branch that withers away. So we're going to be calling on you this year. New leaders, we see something in you. We're going to be calling you to service because the imbalance in your life will be no more. You will be employed. You will be out there. You will be doing what God has called you to do. And when you're in the right place doing what you've been called to do, it's enjoyable. And then you're going to have community here. Community. I call back some of those who are just watching online. You need community. You need community. Yes, I know. I get it. The lights, it's video, it's comfortable. You're in your PJs. You still need community. There are 7,350 people just like you. You need to connect with. I'm talking to you online. And if you're, you're watching from a different country or different state, you find a local church. You can still watch us online. You can watch us, you know, uh, on demand. But you find a community that you can connect with. Well, pastor, my church isn't safe. Make it safe. You find a group, a small group, you build it and you make it safe. You need community or you will continue to be unbalanced. Family, do you want balance? Are you willing to join us on this journey from Mount Carmel to the valley wherever God calls us to be if that's where you are I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet as we pray praise the Lord this is a new year sermon new year sermon we're going to start a new series we're going to start a new series starting next Sabbath it'll be on the life of Elisha this is the prequel I like prequels but we have a story about Elisha because we have this story about Elijah. Somebody say amen. We're going to know a lot about Elisha and the good that he did in his life because of what Elijah was willing for God to do through him. There's a person I want you to meet, Elijah. He will be your pupil. His name is Elisha. But it starts here, family. It starts here. Balance. Let us pray. Father God, thank you so much for the opportunity for us to know you better. We thank you for the challenge you've given us coming into this new year. Thank you for bringing us through 2023. There was a lot of turmoil, a lot of upheaval, a lot of imbalance. But Father, we feel like the, the ship has been steadied a bit, but we know in order for it to be sustainable, there are things that we need to continue to do that are healthy. So we're going to individually take responsibility over our own lives so that we can collectively contribute to the healthiness of the entire body. Father, our children will benefit from us being more healthy. Our spouses will benefit from us being more healthy. Our community will. So, Father, we're going to take serious our diet. We're going to take serious our exercise, our sleeping habits. 
And Father, we're going to take serious our moments with you that extend beyond the worship experience, that are beyond the fire, the earthquake, the wind, just quiet moments where we can hear your still small voice. May we learn some of those practical ways of doing it through the life of Elisha when we study that in the next coming weeks. And Father, thank you for giving us community. Thank you for giving us this church. We're here. Father, for those who may have been triggered in this message because of mental health issues, because of trauma, because of anything, Father, those who may be bipolar, Father, we ask for you to heal and restore. We know that you have used science. You have, you have partnered with science and medicine. You did that when you were here on this earth with your saliva and dirt. You, you, you have no problem working with what people see as modern medicine. But, Father, you must be a part of those ingredients. So may it be real in their lives today, moving forward. This will not just be a happy new year. It won't be just a few resolutions. It is us being resolute, moving forward. We want to be balanced. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated.